The moment I was past the cage door, I galloped for Brimstone's cell. It hurt my shoulder terribly, but I knew exactly what was going to happen. Hey, Pegasus. I heard the clattering of hooves from behind me as the raiders cantered out into the light from the shops near the entrance. I didn't even look back. Come on out and play. Don't you even want those feathers back? They lightly chased me close to Brimstone's area. Only after I had ducked in did I look back. The ragged leader was wearing my feathers around a band on his head. The small group of them clambered around near the fountain, wearing clothing I could only hope only looked like skin. Brimstone was waiting inside. With a few stomps he made his way to the entrance, glaring back at the raiders through the cage. You can't keep our prize away from us forever, traitor. Not both of them. With a shake of his mane, Brimstone gave little heed to them, merely ushering me further inside while he watched the raiders back off. Not for the first time, I began to hate my sensitive hearing as I picked up the remainder of the raiders laughing in their own spots. Alongside them, I could hear the groans of those slaves not lucky enough to enjoy the big warlord's protection. Try not to entice them, Merc. Brimstone's voice was as rough as ever, like gravel. The guards, Shackles, and I keep them in line as best we can, but they are just waiting to let all that aggression out on some pony. You can't pen raiders up. But I didn't- You appeared. For them. That's good enough reason. Really, I didn't know what to say. But I got the hint. Stay hidden, stay low. I'd heard too many tales of what raiders would do. Torture, rape, cannibalism, and everything in between. I had almost been their toy earlier. Look, Brimstone, I got something for her. I tapped my saddlebag, attracting Brimstone's attention more properly. Without a word more, he encouraged me into the back of the shop. Useless. I slumped down on my haunches with a sigh as Brimstone gently nudged the rat away. There had never been any question that I would give it to her instead of using it to fight off my own disease. Already I could feel my lungs beginning to clam up a little more after healing from Protégé's doctor some hours ago. I'd been where she was. I didn't wish it on any pony. Useless? It's simple, really. Brimstone turned back to her, resting silently for now. I could have got some from the slave markets, but Glimmer can't take Rat away. Something in it sets off an allergic reaction. Oh, I'm sorry. No matter. Just means the first plan still has to go ahead. Find the alternative. Brimstone clearly went deep into thought as he began piecing together his plan. Hesitantly, I sat and watched Glimmerlight. Her chest was moving so little while she was sweating and quivering under her blanket. A bucket for rat-induced vomiting sat nearby. I could have sworn it had been red when I'd trotted by it. But I didn't simply see a mare who was sick. Past my natural distrust of all ponies I hadn't met, I saw in her one last chance. Alone I didn't have a hope. I was weak, scared, uneducated, and utterly naive of the world around me that wasn't a slaver demanding I work. And I wasn't even very good at that work either. By all my heart I wanted out. The sketches of freedom I had left in my journal and on Whiplash's walls proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt. But since my failure, the thought of running at that wall again felt like madness. Once again, I arrived at that same horrid feeling. I was exactly what I had been like before the pit again. Too afraid of repercussions and punishment to have the courage to do it. Whatever had driven me before was beginning to fade fast. But that was where Glimmerlight came in. By Brimstone's story of her life, she sounded like my best chance to find some pony who wanted the same thing as me, who wouldn't judge me and would be willing to maybe, just maybe... Help me. The unknown mare had shown me that ponies could be nice. Now I had to trust in her belief about there being other good ponies in Philadelphia beside her. If I ever wanted out of here, I'd need them. Right now I had no direction, and no drive pushing me to do something before an event happened like before. My life had been thrown into the grind of slavery once again. If I were to just let it happen, I knew I would be lost forever to the slave in my mind. Glimmerlight might be my last hope. 
she could very well be the first step to doing something to build toward an escape attempt again. No matter what, I couldn't let her die, or I might see all my chances go with her. Taking a deep breath, I looked up at the big raider. So, what do we do? Brimstone looked sideways at me with a severe expression. We? Truth be told, I hadn't properly thought this through, but I knew I wanted to. Look, you say she wants out. So do I, right? But I tried to escape and failed badly, Brimstone. I... I'm scared of doing anything, even if it helps me in the end. Really scared! Protégé seems okay, but... but... the master... I lost my train of thought, the feeling of him beating me to the ground, the harsh sensation of his cracked hoof playing along my cutie mark. Shifting back into the dark of the gloomy back room, I heard Brimstone glower a little at my natural habit to seek a dark place to hide in. Even the big raider could see the pain in my eyes. He hurt you. Yes. Little more than a tiny whimper. Water. And hitting me. I... I thought he was going to break me. Brimstone's expression didn't change much, but I know he'd seen the master buck me to the raiders. I tried to dry my eyes, moving out and standing up before Brimstone to attempt an appeal to his respect of bravery. But from the kind of pony you said she is, then I know I need to save her, Brimstone, just as much as you need to. That and, I've been where Glimmerlight is now. That's why I wanted to give my rat away to you. I knew I'd want someone to do it for me. Still, that stone-faced expression didn't move. For a good half minute, he simply stared at me, before shaking his head. I must be getting too much of a softie these days. All right, you could come in handy anyways. If you could get to the wall, you can clearly stick to the shadows. But know this. Like before, if I feel you are ever threatening the success of this, then you can trot home and explain to Protégé yourself. Understood? I gulped, wondering just what I'd gotten into. Okay, so what are we doing? His plan was remarkably simple, yet fraught with intense levels of danger. There was a renovated hospital near the Philadelphia Crater Edge, just outside of the exclusion zone. Due to the ambient radiation, however, it was often more used for important slave workers rather than any of Red Eye's group. As such, it was a lot less defended, or guarded, and held overall less medical supplies than those closer to the hub of the city. Brimstone explained the name to recognize it as the Hearts and Hooves Hospital. Of course, I'd never be able to identify it by words alone. So he had said he'd simply point it out instead. I had asked why Protégé hadn't gotten any for her, but the answer was simple. Glimmer Light didn't qualify for rare stocks, even with Protégé's influence. As such, Brimstone was aiming to find and simply take whatever stock they kept. How we got there was most interesting. The cell had a back door that was jammed shut. It led to the outside, an old delivery door, apparently. Protégé and the slavers believed it unusable because of the thickly rusted hinges, but Brimstone had a theory that it was simply blocked on the other side. With a little clearing and his strength to push it, the door might open. The problem was clearing it. He was heavily guarded whenever taken for a work detail, due to killing guards in the past. As such, my part of his plan was to crawl through the air ducts and drop off outside, then clear the doorway. As a pair, we would make our way to the hospital around the edge of the crater, away from attention. Brimstone would get me past whatever guard existed at the supply door, and I would sneak in to find the medicine. Hopefully I might be able to steal some rat away, too, to help with my disease. I didn't particularly like my roles, if I was honest. Sneaking through cramped air ducts in pitch-black darkness, skirting a balefire crater and sneaking into a place I didn't know to find something I probably couldn't read the name of didn't feel too reliable. Of course, there was another problem. Me. Today had not been easy. I was still particularly a nervous wreck, held together only by a mission to achieve and the fact that I possessed my journal and pitbuck again. But even with my fleece again, I had a horrible feeling that every pony would still recognize me and know I had wings. 
Even as I sat flicking through my journal, waiting for Brimstone to give the go, I gazed almost longingly at the sketches I'd done of myself without wings. I was tired. Oh, so tired. If I closed my eyes, I began to sweat in a fear that the master would be the one waking me up. Sometimes, if I saw Brimstone in the darkness of the store's back rooms, I would yelp in fear and turn to run before I remembered it wasn't the horrifying form of the master. The closest I took to solace was glancing at Glimmerlight. Even while sick, she looked somewhat peaceful. Her white coat would have shone had it not been coated in the dust and dirt of slavery. But her short two-tone pink mane still held so much color. Briefly, I felt regret at only having charcoal and not colored chalk to draw with. Really? I was only seeking distractions from the real problems. How could I do this? What had I agreed to? Brimstone had let it known that if I wasn't up to it, I was getting left behind. My shoulder ached. I was sure I'd caught something from the freezing water of the hose, and my mind was a mess trying to stop the indoctrination of the slave from controlling everything I did again. Only my drawing was keeping me ready to do this at the minute. I sat in a corner of the back room, using the flickering light from my pitbuck to lighten up my journal, muttering my mantra in my head. Lines became curves. I sketched out the first thing that came to mind. Imposing and terrifying, Brimstone Blitz stood over the weakened form of Glimmerlight, steadfastly protecting her against anything and everything that dared come his way. Even as I drew it, an envy crept in. I found myself wishing I had some pony so determined to help me as that. Some pony to watch over me. Well, there was the mare, but destiny seemed determined to separate our paths at every turn. I flipped away from the image, going back a few pages. Quite by accident, I landed on the one of just myself in the bottom left of the page, the rest left completely empty. Looking at my smiling face, I tapped a hoof against the paper, almost pathetically, really. I just wished I could be that pony, the one who seemed to be laughing through that big grinning smile, his wings spread proudly either side of his body, worn openly. <sighs> who was I kidding? Dreams and fantasies, that's all I drew. I was no free pony, just a pegasus too scared to show his wings for the judgmental hate he would receive. I was even afraid of ponies on my side. Burk. The rough voice was spoken just loud enough not to wake Glimmerlight. I saw Brimstone looming in the darkness. It's time. I'd been in the mall less than a couple hours and already I was about ready to sneak back out of it. Despite my fear, some part of me congratulated myself for not having lost all of my momentum, even if I still wasn't mentally ready to start preparing another full escape attempt. But if all this worked out, perhaps I wouldn't be alone in that endeavor. The ventilation was located near the back of the slave area in the mall, just off one of the staircases leading to the upper level of slave cells. Brimstone settled down low enough that I could clamber onto his back and reach the ventilation shaft. A little dexterous hoof and mouth work with a steel bar and I had prized the mesh cover free just enough to slip in. Tall and wide enough to permit me to at least turn and moderately sit up, it was almost a perfect fit for me, even if I knew it would cause a stooping pain by the end of the run. Even so, compared to the filthy drain pipe I'd inhabited before, it was wondrously dry and surprisingly cool against the humid heat of Philadelphia. Momentarily, I kept it in mind as a possible hiding spot, where no pony else could reach me, safe in its hidden sheltered tunnels. I turned back to Brimstone to pull the mesh shut, seeing his beady and mismatching eyes staring up at me. Holding it up for me, he paused before it closed over. You are right finding your way, Merck. I think so. Just keep heading toward the walls until I find somewhere I can prize through, right? Brimstone nodded. I'd hoped for a smile, at least. But he just remained grim. Aye, that's right. Knock four times on the shop's back door when it's clear, and I'll buck it open. Just make sure you stand back. Remember, four times, or I won't open. Got everything you need. I checked myself over. My now unarmored fleece, goggles, and pitbuck stayed with me, in addition to a length of rope Brimstone had within his own possessions in the cell. While waiting, I had cut my fleece down a little. 
Philadelphia's atmosphere and temperature was far too high for a fully covering and tight thermal fleece like I had designed for the wastes outside. Now it only went down to just before my cutie mark. It left my hind legs uncovered to fight the heat, while still having enough leeway to hide my wings rather reliably. A noticeable absence of my inventory was my butterfly yellow saddlebag and journal. Don't you worry your head about that book. It's safer with Glimmer right now than clogging you up in the tunnels. Was my face really that transparent of what I was thinking about? Celestia helped me if I ever got a mare friend in my life. I pulled the mesh back over with my mouth and slipped my goggles over my eyes, pausing only for a second more. But Brimstone? I... I bit my lip. Talking to this warlord had always been somewhat awkward, even when he opened up a little. Thank you. I mean, really, for helping me. I hope I don't let you down. I'm not too reliable at succeeding at anything in life. Even... even aside from that, Glimmerlight is the only hope I've got to find some pony to help me right now. I just don't want to fail you. Brimstone looked almost confused why I'd even spoken. I was confused about what I'd said. But the big raider just tapped the mesh lightly. To my surprise, he smiled. Do this for me, Merc, he whispered. And you'll have at least a modicum of my trust. She means everything to me, Merc. Everything. Not many ponies would even try to help the way you're doing. I... I'll try. Good. I'll wait in the shop. Try not to get bucked off another balcony without me around to raise some hill for you, okay? I could swear he was grinning as he turned and trotted away from me. Taking a deep breath, I turned and crawled away into the vent systems. The thick darkness ahead of me made my skin crawl, but I couldn't help but feel I wasn't quite out of the saddle yet for finding a way out of this nightmare. Time to go save a life. A life who could possibly end up saving mine in return. There were many ponies I had to thank in my life. The stable dweller, Brimstone, the mare, my mother, the DJ, even Glimmerlight already for having smiled at me and being a goal to me in these times when I feared I might lack a direction. But right now, Sundial was the one directing light into my life, quite literally. His pitbuck's flickering and half-broken torchlight was about the only thing keeping me away from a panicked state of claustrophobia. Sometimes I wondered, did that word mean I had a phobia? I hoped not. How were you meant to tell? How would I ever tell? I was scared of my own- Ah! I dived away, rolling and curling up as I saw the shadow of some pony else crawl- Oh. Well, didn't I feel like an idiot? What could I do? I was nervous. Trotting along a hoof at a time and almost pitch black? Of course I was jumpy! I honestly didn't have a clue where I was. On rare occasions, I had passed a vent going downwards, sometimes with faded light drifting in from the room below, but I didn't recognize them. The creaking and often haphazardly bending air ducts seemed to threaten a collapse any time, and worst of all, I heard things. Skittering noises and clicking from down other tunnels. After the drain pipe before, I didn't dare imagine what little horrors lurked around in the darkness, waiting for an almost blind pony to stumble across their lairs. Often, I'd had to turn back from a route after the duct had gotten so thin I could barely crawl under it. Why were some bits pony-sized and some not? Didn't they think of a tiny escaping pegasus when they designed it? Why think of a glass roof to resist a balefire megaspell, and nothing to let some pony get back out again? What kind of builder made this place? Every tunnel felt like an inaccessible wall of black. I wasn't making any progress in a quiet and terrifying environment like this. Reluctantly, I reached to my pit buck and flipped the radio on a low volume. Technically a bad idea, but I wasn't getting anywhere without some moral encouragement. Now, what was the DJ station position on the dial again? Remind every worker of Philadelphia, you have given again and again for a great cause. Fear not for the future, for you are ensuring it. How many times do I need to tell you, Wastelanders? Ghouls are ponies, too!
With a relieved sigh, I relaxed as that soothing voice came to my ears for the first time since my escape attempt. Something about that familiarity, that informal intimacy of just me and his messages helped give me a better feeling that I wasn't alone in this dark and dreary place. Hasn't our resident muffin-loving traitor shown you all something? Well, let me set the record straight once and for all. A ghoul is just a pony without the hair and skin with the added ability of being more or less immortal, so far as we know. Making better progress with the comfort of sound to only my ears, I felt happier about this mission. I could see a small bit of light up ahead, perhaps some place to get my bearings. They feel, they care, and they hurt just like any of us. So next time you see one, do old Pwn for your favor, will ya? Give him a little smile, just to remind them that not every pony out there is a judgmental old relic of the past, eh? Stopping for just a second, I sighed. Ghouls I was alright with. One of my masters had been one, and I hadn't ever judged him for his skin. Or lack of it. Okay, I did once call him Rotten Corpse in my head once. But only because he had hit me first. But I wasn't hearing any big calls for an ease-up on Pegasi any time soon. Of course, zombie ponies. Yeah, give them the fast track to a little peace at last, everyone. Just learn to tell the difference. It's no fun living in a world where every pony else wants to shoot you just for looking a little more varied than your average pony we see every day. Lying down on all fours, I gradually scooted up to the vent the light was peering from. I could hear voices. Now, in further news, how about those events over near old Sweet Apple Acre? Master, why didn't you let us finish off the bass? Silence! You know why. I felt a chill pass through me. That voice, even just the one word, silence, made me freeze on the spot and not dare make a sound lest I be punished for speaking out of turn. I tried to remind myself I was only staying quiet to remain undetected. I wished that were the only reason. Peeping down, I saw a filthy room with an old metal table, racks of slaver tools like whips, knives, and magical shock rods, and a single bed more filthy than most ones I'd seen exposed to the outside. Against the wall, there was a single door to some retrofitted cupboard. I couldn't see much more, although it seemed relatively cluttered with random bits and bobs. But I had a single, chilling thought as I looked in from the vent above the bed. This was his room. I could see the master standing behind the metal desk, while the raider he was talking to was out of sight. I was shaking so much I could feel my loose tooth rattling. Part of me began to worry it'd fall out and give me away. That Pegasus bastard can offer much more than just one quick vent to me, Raider. I'm a slaver. I don't make my life by killing those I have control over. Not how we do things. The voice was uppity. The master cut him off with a growl. Ah, get close to it. How you do things doesn't matter in here to me. I have plans for him the moment Protege isn't around to do his best little student act. That green little book is mine. You just keep me informed. That is all. I was shaking. Part of me wanted to drop down. Give myself up. The slave spying on his master was wrong. Disgusted that my mind even still responded to him, I cursed my indoctrination and tried to fight the urge. Thoughts of a dying unicorn on a sofa were enough to solidify my thoughts for now. Concentrate on the goal, not on the slavery. Instead, I reached out, stretching over the vent to try and get a look at who the informant was. When we were out there with Brimstone Blitz, we- Raider, I don't care. The master's voice had dropped. I still couldn't see the raider. I stretched out just a little more, pushing my hoof forward to balance myself on the other side. You are not out there anymore. I keep you from the worst of things because you are useful to me. You keep the various packs of your kind down there in line, now that their old leader is under some repentance crusade. Now get out of here and return to your cell. I'm not in the mood for you. Just one thing. He must have been right at the doorway, trotting away just as I thought I was about to find out. Damn it! Sweating, I brought my whole body weight forward over the vent to try and glance right down through the grill from the opposite side. I could feel my aching shoulder beginning to shake. What? 
His voice slapped into every instinct of mine to perk up. I faltered, jerking and struggling to stay upright. Oh, this was a bad idea. A very bad idea. I could feel my hoof slipping. What do you want with him anyway? If it's pain you want, we could arrange that. Oh, goddesses, help me and give me the strength not to slip. The master chuckled lowly, a sick sound, promising all of his sadistic nature. I'm a born slaver, raider. I simply want him to be commanded, to do everything I tell him. He is a born slave, you know. Everything I could want, a pegasus and a weak little slave all in one. I don't want to kill him. Oh, no. No. I would rather he be worn down, day by day. I'm not a simplistic sadist brute like yourself, Raider. I don't want his death. I want his life. He dropped into Philadelphia so perfectly. It could only have been better if he had dropped right into my room. My hoof slipped. I felt my entire body weight collapse downwards toward the vent cover before jamming to a halt just as quickly with a painfully loud squeal. My pit buck! The edge in the tough leather had caught on the gap between the vent and mesh. Praying for it not to break, I pulled my weight back up. With a leap as silent as I could, I dove over the vent with a dull thud and turned off the light. The fuck was that? The raider cried out. I curled up in a ball, afraid to move. The master's hoof must have come crashing down, for I heard a painful smack of hoof to skull. Don't you step toward me in my room. Okay... That was pretty hair-triggered. I might have thought more on why he'd been so suddenly angry, but I was too concentrated on trying to make no noise. Okay, okay. Another harsh cracking sound and a dull cry of pain. I don't like your tone one bit, Raider. You are the slave. I am the master. Yes, master. Despite the beating, I could still hear resistance in the voice. I imagined raiders used to independence were more resilient to the master's beatings and overbearing nature than I was. Really, was I that pathetic? The imagery of the everlasting chain in my mind begged to differ. The master was right. I was meant to be his. But he wasn't going to get me. Not forever. I couldn't bear the nightmare to have him control my entire life. I had to escape him. I had to. Even as I heard the master throw the raider out and return to sit upon his bed, muttering about rad roaches and the ducks, I lay right above him, silently willing myself out of a frozen state of terror. Even without seeing me, he could still hurt me. I had to escape him. I had to, before he dug his chains in any deeper to my life. Remaining still until the master had left, my continuation through the ducks was hesitant and without the illumination of my pit buck light. After one near miss, I didn't dare turn it on again. At first, the cloying darkness had led to near disaster by almost falling down a thinner shaft. My heart still raced as I imagined the implications. To be stuck, unable to move, and wedged in a thin shaft, vertically, with no pony ever able to respond to my screams. But since... My eyesight had begun to adjust a little as I got used to it. There was actually some light from occasional grates, so staying only on natural light allowed me to stay unseen and focus on direction. It had taken me some wandering, but eventually I was certain I had to be near the outer rooms of the mall and chose a vent to exit from. Bucking the vent off the wall, I dropped into the darkened room. Dust swirled around my hooves, making me choke and cough as I found my chosen room to be seemingly untouched since, presumably, before the mega-spells. Before the end. I didn't want to spend too much time here. I didn't do pre-war investigation. Coughing into my hoof every few steps and rolling my sore shoulder out from the scamper through the air ducts, I made my way through the preserved space. It looked like an old janitorial station, thick with centuries of dirt and dust and occupied by creepy thick webs covering the roof, furniture, and corners. They caught on my hooves and dragged behind me everywhere. I could see two doors barred and locked from the inside, with thick metal bars, while masses of empty food, 
drink packagings, and a ton of used rataway sachets littered the space. Most was situated around a central desk that held various terminal monitors that flickered and fizzed eternally from some error. One of them was flashing a message on screen, on and off. A large red word seemed like a warning, while scrolling text ran over and over beneath it. Some pony had barred themselves in here to survive. But if there were barred doors, then where were they? A little hunting for a way to unlock the doors later, I found him. An old buck, preserved even in death. He was lying on a small makeshift bed in the cleaning cupboard, and around his bed's side lay dozens upon dozens of inhalers. The smell was not fresh, but a sweet, musty, and sickly defilement that had lain here for generations. My heart began to tighten at my imagination beginning to take off. Imagery and visualization... It was doing it again, piecing it all together, working out the last moments, the reasons why, and the visual memory of what had happened here when the spells detonated across Philadelphia. Had I missed photos? Did he have family? What did he hear? What was that little glint coming from his saddlebag? What was it like living alone in one room until you slowly died? No! I literally slapped myself across the face with a hoof, throwing cobweb into my face. I couldn't afford another breakdown of sadness about the past. Brimstone and Glimmerlight were relying on me now. I turned and ran from the cupboard, leaning against the monitors to catch my now rasping breath. Taking a few seconds to compose myself, I moved to the door with an exit symbol above it and shoved the crates out of the way to reveal the lock. I knew where I'd seen the key. Of course it had been on him. I knew I had to hurry, but I had to take a few moments to rest. My shoulder ached and throbbed, while the stiffness from the master's treatments and the raider beating were coming back to haunt me. Okay. Okay. Just a corpse. Just a fresh-looking corpse. You've been in sewage. I continued my mantra until I was back in the cupboard. Shaking, I lowered my head to the saddlebag and bit the thin loop of string that held the key. There. Nothing. Nothing to it. My imagination was hard to turn off. This felt wrong. I was disturbing the gentle sleep of the long dead. This poor stallion had died alone in his probably workplace, desperately trying to stave off sickness and radiation. And now I was stealing from him? Was I really that kind of thief already? The key came loose, and the saddlebag dropped to the floor, the long, worn canvas loops simply falling apart at a mere touch. The body shifted as it lost the extra weight, gurgling from expelled air. I fought the urge not to be sick, and desperately tried not to breathe through my nose, carefully, so as not to disturb his long rest further. I stepped back with my eyes closed in respect and looped the key around my neck on the string. Please forgive me. It's for a good cause. I promise. Goddesses let you rest. I opened my eyes, and found his face staring back at mine from less than an inch away, eyes open. For a second or two, it stared, twitching and making small clicking sounds. And then it howled. There was a dry intake of air before an unholy screech of corrupt and petrified vocal cords filled the room, echoed in my ears, and froze every muscle in my body through a terror I had never known in my life. The corpse's mouth distended, opening far more than a pony's mouth had any right to be. Lacking control, I felt myself collapse before it, mouth open, unable to scream at all as my eyes watered, and yet dared not blink. The corpse began to thrash with spasms, with old muscles long underused coming back to life in necromantic horror. I began to scream as it clawed its way across the bed toward me on broken and limp legs. Survival instinct kicked in, and I began pulling myself from the room. I begged my body to work well enough to stand. I... I couldn't. Paralyzing fear filled me, freezing my every motion. Behind me, it screamed again, yanking itself across the covers furiously enough to make the bed slam into the wall behind it. Falling against the desk, 
The monitors fell from the table, smashing and fizzing as I used the table's edge to get to my hooves. Shifting and flopping, it fell from the bed. A ruined body, animated even after all this time. Finding my hooves, I galloped for the door and began fumbling, trying to get the key in my mouth. The thing howled, wailed, and screamed as it pulled itself on one good front hoof after me across the janitor's office. Its mouth waggled loosely, and it began to claw and tug my way with a frenzy that seemed beyond anything I had seen any raider do. Come on! Come on! Please! 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 I almost dropped the key before working it into the lock and turning it. The door refused to move. Was this the wrong key? I could hear it just a few feet behind me, but I couldn't look. The sound came closer. Closer! Nothing else to do. I bashed and pushed against the door, begging at the top of my voice for it to open. Praying to the goddesses while trapped in this tiny space with... Whatever that was! Ramming my whole weight into the door, it finally began to budge. By an inch. Come on! Help! Some pony! Ramming myself against it again and again. I didn't even notice that it was my injured shoulder bashing on the hard metal outer door. Such was the terror that propelled me, as I turned and saw the... The... Ghoul? Was it a zombie ghoul? It was flopping over the monitors, hooves outstretched to drag me in. On my fourth strike, it was close enough to rub my back hooves with its front ones, as I felt cold dead flesh drift over me. Screaming, I pushed myself through the gap, kicking backward and struggling on the other side to shove the door shut. With a final wail, I slammed it closed, hearing it screaming after me from the inside, dulled by the doorway. Slight thumps impacted against the door as the beast rattled itself against it in an effort to get at me. Sitting with my back to it until the thumping stopped, I listened to the groaning shifts from a ghoul pulling itself away inside to... to do whatever it did when alone again. Before me sat the open nightmare of Philadelphia and a vista of the Balefire Crater. Below the security walls surrounding it, it glowed an unearthly red in the haze of the smog covering this city, that scar on the world that had caused such abominations as the kind that were now through this door. It was unnatural, like a haze that grew and fell like some open wound upon Equestria that pulsated, never closing. I might have thought that despite this sight, the open world was simply the most beautiful thing I had ever seen out of nothing but relief to be out of the claustrophobic ducks in deadly abandoned halls, but I was too busy laying down on the catwalk fire escape and crying to even care. Hey, buddy? I sniffed and kept trotting slowly around the mall. Hey! Hey! Buck! Buddy! You alright? Raising my head, I wiped my eyes to look at the speaker. Another slave. A bright young earth pony buck of cold blue and a fiery red mane. I could see rad sores like mine on his flank, actually damaging his cutie mark of a bouncing ball. He was cantering across from a small group that were passing by toward the industrial lines. The rest didn't stop. What's wrong? I've seen upset slaves. Then there's you. He seemed to have been on his way to some workplace, judging by the slip tucked into his clothing. Some slavers gave them to slaves to deliver to new workmasters with instructions. He kept trying to walk in front of me as I plodded along, looking for the doorway to release Brimstone. I'm fine. Forgive me, buddy. You don't look it. I cast him a stronger look. Not that it said much for me. He seemed nice, but I was just too tired and fragile at the moment. Hey, sorry. Just asking. Stopping and sitting down, I rubbed my eyes and sighed. Perhaps I'd been too harsh on him. How often did a slave ask to help anyway? No, no, sorry. A hard day. More than most. Accepting this, he settled and nodded wandering around to face me. I hear ya. What's your name? Murky. I muttered it, fearing if I spoke too loudly, the crack in my voice would be too obvious. Flippy bit. Glad to meet you. Could swear we've been near each other on shifts, you know. I'd remember a pony as small as you. Gee, thanks. He was right, though. I didn't tend to remember faces. Before I'd been woken up by the stable dweller, I had simply existed as an ongoing bad dream, not paying much attention to anything. That said, 
the bright blue face of this pony did ring a bell. He didn't miss a beat, filling in as I stayed quiet. Us slaves, you know. We need to stick together, buddy. Support one another to get through this as best we can. After the horrid encounter minutes ago, the sound of some pony saying things I could agree with was an unimaginably thankful thing to hear. Almost surprised at myself, I allowed my head to turn to him with a smile. Yeah, slavery isn't great. I've only gotten this far because of the help others gave me, Flippy. Gonna get out one day, though. I gotta. Ha! <laughs> High order for yourself, Merc. Gonna take us all with you? If I could. After a wary moment, I caught his smile grow bigger. He giggled, and I felt compelled to do the same. Before I knew it, we were laughing. There was something simple here. A genuine little acknowledgement of a shared hardship that I rarely received. The mare was so... so different, and determined for her place in life to change. Brimstone was... well, brimstone. But this flippy bit? He was just... just normal and friendly. You know, Merc, I know I recognize you from somewhere. You ever work the Paris Sprites? Wait, wait. Southern Wall Reinforcement. Nope. Sorry. Then where the hell do I recognize you from, buddy? The riots? Ah, uh, never mind. Hey, your fleece. What's it made of? Cotton? His voice changed. That last question had been rushed. I'd heard his train of thought change mid-sentence. Why was that? Feeling a little unnerved, I spoke quietly. Yeah, kinda... acquired it. From the thresher. I see. Seriously, nice fleece, though. He reached out, stroking it with a hoof. I made to stand up and move away. But with a sudden movement, he pulled it up, even against my offended shout. A second later, he was on his hooves. The friendly smirk was gone, as my wing was now on full display. I knew it! I knew I recognized you! You're that Pegasus! My mouth hung open. I just wanted to plead. Please, just forget about them. We'd been getting on. We could have been friends. The scowl came back to his face. I recognized him at last. He had flung the half-brick at me in the parade off the lasso. You don't have to hate me. You? It's not you. It's all of you. What do you think you're doing down here, taunting us all with your wings? Why don't you just fly away? I bet that's what the pit book is. It's for spying, isn't it? I can't fucking believe I was being nice to you. He reached into a small pouch, and to my horror, he drew a craft knife. I began to back away, my heart thumping hard. A spike of adrenaline at the danger made me shiver. I couldn't handle this. Not today. You've got all the food up there, don't you? My Nana told us the stories. You left us to starve. She told us how they tore up her hilltop home. They shot her husband for going to pick flowers from the summit. Flippy, please! I'm not from there. I... I can't fly. You're just lying. Stop it. If I know one thing from growing up, it's that Pegasi are all the same. They act all shifty, don't they? That's what everyone says. I knew that if I ever met one that my mama and papa would be right. Taking the knife in his mouth, he flew at me. Squeaking, I fell backward and rolled, narrowly missing the slash from his mouth held weapon. I had just faced a zombie. I wasn't going to freeze here. With a scrambling of hooves, I upped and galloped off hearing him chasing me with the knife swinging around his neck on a small leather line. Diving over a heap of scrap, I used it as a barrier. We're not all the same! It's just how I was born! I didn't ask for them! Stop lying! He galloped and dove over the scrap. I screamed over my back while I galloped myself as fast as I could. But I was limping every few steps, losing ground. I tried to convince him, but it fell on deaf ears. What was wrong with this world, when ponies were being born and cast as slaves, raiders, and bred into hate because of the sins of some past generation? The chase continued around the back of the mall. Only one thing came to my mind. Find the door and get back inside with Brimstone. He would frighten Flippy off. 
Spotting the door, I began to gallop for it. Or I did until my injured limb gave out with a sharp, jabbing pain. Rolling onto my back, I saw the knife descend and, even while shouting in panic, got my pit buck in the way of the blade itself. The jarring impact knocked both of us flat on the ground where hooves began flailing. Hoof-to-hoof -hoof combat was never a particularly clean affair, given more to throwing yourself in with luck and guts. I apparently had neither, but it was enough to find one of my hooves connect with his mouth and knock the knife out. In return, I felt him pound on my chest, driving the wind from me. Scrambling, we separated, even as I dived back at him again. I couldn't give him time to retrieve that knife that hung around his neck. Rearing up, I tried to emulate what I had seen Brimstone do and use my front hooves to slash and strike. Flippy was faster, diving forward into my midsection and taking us both down again. Rolling, I swung him off to one side by tucking my side in to stop him getting a grip. Hearing him curse about my lack of size to get a hold of, I took the opportunity to limp as fast as I could for the door. My heart leapt as I saw it was only kept in place by a few metal pipes that had fallen from the overhang above. Although, enough to stop it opening, they shouldn't prove much of an obstacle to shift. Simply barging into one and yelping at the shocking impact down my back, it fell to the side. The second fell away with it. Putting my back into the third, I began to push, even as Flippy caught up with a stinging blow to the shoulder. Crying out, I went down. Damn it! Why couldn't you just stay away from us all? Your kind chose to save yourselves at the cost of betraying all of us. You brought this on yourselves! Struggling, trying to shift back while keeping my hooves raised, I shook my head. Flippy! Why do you have to do this? I... Uh, I don't want to even know you, never mind to harm you. I'm not a cloud-born peg. His eyes were wide, but his pupils small. He shook with bitterness and psychotic outrage. All I know is my folks were never wrong. You gave us this waste. But I didn't. I don't care. You're one of them. I... I didn't understand. How did a couple of wings make such a difference? It didn't change who you were. I saw him raising the knife even as I pushed the third pipe away with my front hooves and desperately rolled to the side as the knife clattered off the ground and away from his mouth. I leapt for the door, hammering it so hard my hoof stung. How many times was it? Three? Yes, it was three! One, two, three! The moment I was done, I felt Flippy dive for me a second time, his front hooves grabbing me to try and bring my neck up to slit. A horrid moment passed as I felt the cold metal slide lightly against my neck. Why wasn't the door opening? We struggled, thumping into the door one more time before I was finally thrown to the ground painfully mewling in pain as he stamped a hoof on my shoulder to keep me there. Lying at the side of the doorway on my back, I felt Flippy round off and take the knife in his mouth. He walked in front of the door toward me, a baleful look in his eye. Brimstone bucked the door open with a force that defied belief. Trotting out, the massive earth pony looked around before settling on me. Merk, what happened? Brim, behind you! My warning seemed to fall on deaf ears, as the raider warlord turned nonchalantly. Nothing happened. With an annoyed glance that told me to stop shouting, he closed the door again. Only then did the lifeless body of Flippy Bit fall to the ground, his neck broken from being struck by the door. Hate. I'd been disliked and mistreated all too often, but I'd never experienced hate until I came to this city. He hadn't just hated me or my wings. He had shown a real, underlying and educated hate against anything I stood for, minuscule or otherwise. So many ponies had done the same this morning while they pelted me on my parade from the Master. He hated Pegasi too, to the point he wanted to ruin my life. The raiders had wanted to pull my wings off. Ragini had called me flightless. Even Brimstone admitted he hated the Pegasi. Out in the wastes, the distrust was bad enough. And here, where Pegasi were seen as a convenient target for hurt slaves to take out their frustrations on, it was terrible. I'd been running ever since the pit. From my slave life, from death, from the master, and from the opinion every pony had of me, just because I had feathers. But the truth was... I had been running all my life, time and again, from
from master to master, fellow slave to fellow slave. Even while covered, I knew I couldn't get too close to most ponies. I hadn't been exiled from the clouds, but their deeds still cast down upon me in the hell beneath them. I was no dashite, but I was an outcast all the same. No longer could I handle it. These wings had been useless to me. They had hurt me, taunted me with their inability to even move or spread out, and now, all day, they'd brought nothing but pain. Rolling up my fleece, I gently pulled one of my stiff and painful wings around in my hooves. The wing stem felt limp, and the feathers still on it were caked in dirt and unkempt. An embarrassment of a wing. I wish I never had these things. I found myself muttering quietly, almost forcing it away from me. The hatred for my own body felt uncomfortable and hollow. It felt wrong, but undeniable. As I lay shuddering, trying to make sense of what my screwed-up mental state was thinking, I heard Brimstone advance on me. With a sigh and a glance at the direction we should have headed in, he stared down at me, looking at my frayed wings. You helped get that door open, so I'll give you a little respect, kid. What do those things mean to you? What do they tell you? I sniffed, trying to hide soft sobs as I avoided his piercing gaze. That... I'm to blame for a lot of bad things that the Pegasi did. That there are some sins that ponies haven't forgiven them for yet. And these wings put them on my shoulders, too. The massive raider grumbled, his old face wrinkling and staring into nothingness with a surprisingly weary look. Did you do any of it? I shook my head. No! How could I? It was hundreds of years ago. Then why are you wishing to be punished for it? Picture yourself taking that pony's knife and cutting them off. Just imagine walking away and leaving your wings lying there in a heap. Forever lost. Do you want that? That gave me pause, and for a moment, I actually imagined doing that to myself. I suddenly felt ashamed for even having thought it. Like someone had dumped cold water over my thoughts. The imagery was uncomfortable. Unspeakable. No, I didn't want it. Gently, I hugged my own body, protecting them. I was just hurt, and in the pain I was lashing out at myself, the same way others had at me. Brimstone Blitz seemed to not need an answer. He sat up again, and turned away, as though about to leave. I thought he was done talking, until he stopped and looked over his shoulder. You're a Pegasus, Merc. Wings alone don't change that and they aren't all that defines what being a pegasus or any other kind of pony means. You'll always be one, even if you don't have them. Something inside you, your soul, magic center or whatever, it's always going to be that of a pegasus, born for the clouds, bound to the open sky, and all that other airy nonsense. It's who you are. I could have sworn I saw a knowing rise of an eyebrow. You don't just turn your back on stuff like that. It doesn't work that way. I stared back, before daring to rise to my hooves and lowering my head. I'm just afraid. That buck wanted to be my friend until he saw them. Not all ponies are like that. You met many, but not all are. Glimmerlight wouldn't care if you were a winged zebra. What do you think I go through? I'm the raider who many ponies can say killed someone they knew through commands to my clan. So from experience... You learn to live with it. You learn to understand the good it's given you. For me, it's the reminders that I keep on my path I'm on. For you? Well, maybe it's already done more good for you than you've realized yet. I had to admit, after this day of hell, the last line gave me a small warmth of hope to cling on to. I'd been pushed into action by watching someone fly. I always looked to the sky above the walls. Brimstone glanced away again, and started trotting forward. No, come on. I'm no good with this youthful cheering up crap. Once we're moving, you'll have more things to consider than depressive escapism. Not like I could cut off my clan markings. I followed behind him. After all this, I'd need time to think. I still hadn't quite come to terms with the thought that, not a day ago, I had been close to hurling myself from a tower. But Brimstone's words had struck deep. 
and for the first time since I felt anything other than numb about who I was. He was truly an unusual pony. I needed time. Time to let it all out and speak to someone about it all. Maybe Protégé would listen. As I saw Brimstone start to trot off, I cantered after him, limping badly and pushing everything I could to the back of my mind. I didn't quite manage it, but the action of starting this small dangerous journey galvanized my mind to think more actively and stay in the moment. Wait! Wait! Brimstone! What about Glimmerlight? She'll be safe. Aye, safer than us. The raiders think I'm sleeping in there guarding her. They won't come near to her, or your little mare book. That caught me off guard enough to splutter and blush. Why did this always happen to me? You, you looked at my journal? Brimstone actually grinned as he looked back and down at me. Told you before, patience isn't my strong point. Seems you have some interesting tastes. My mouth just hung open as I stumbled on limp legs and fell, covering my face with my hooves in embarrassment. He was exaggerating about it. I knew he was. But it didn't make it feel any better. Oh, come on, Merc. It's not like I'm going to judge you. Looking up, I saw his dry grin. True to his word, at least, he seemed to have at least a small degree of tolerance for me after helping him to get out of the mall. He terrified me. He had often spoken of how he would leave me behind or kill me if I caused him problems. In Philadelphia, one's own needs often came above temporary companions. But right now, he was my ally, and I had attained a certain level of trust from him in this task to save his friend, to save the mare that promised him salvation, and me a step toward escaping. As the pair of us prepared to canter into the red haze of Philadelphia, I flipped down my goggles, shuffled to get my wings comfortable in my fleece, and tightened the strap on my damaged pit buck before standing as tall as I could. I had faltered. I had failed and been hurt by it. But so long as I had a direction, some goal and something to hope for, I was not about to stop yet. I'd failed, but I'd try again to reach the sky beyond. I'll follow you out of here yet, little Pip. Just you wait and see. Footnote. Percutained. Luna's Moonlight. After some time to get used to the dark surrounding you, things have begun to seem much clearer now. Your eyes now adapt well to low-light conditions. Who says the night need last forever? <laughs>